Hello, friends! Welcome back to Book Club! <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to do a thing, I don't know. Yes, hello, we are back, and we brought a friend this time. And we are, we've, we've recreated the original inspiration for Book Club! Because these, this is the three that were here during a side quest, the first side quest segment when it was like, let's talk about books, True. and then people were like, "Hey, you should, uh, you should talk about books more." So here we are, and we're going to talk about books today. We are going to talk about *How's Moving Castle*, the book, which is different from the movie a little bit, but we'll get there. Anyway, how are you ladies doing today? Excellent. I actually finished the book yesterday, so um, <laughs> I may have noticed posted in the way ahead of schedule. Or what? Sorry, one thirty. I'm the one who went to bed at two for a completely different reason, but <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, to this book's credit, I intended to finish it today, um, but I, I was going to go to bed early last night. But I crawled into bed and started reading, and then did not stop <laughs> until the book was done. Um, so. That's a sign of a problems. good book. If it makes <laughs> yeah. you stay up too late. <laughs> That's a big problem. Yeah. yeah. Um, I started reading at work on Tuesday, I believe. And I had, like, fully intended to, like, make write down some notes to, like, talk about, like, some things on certain pages and, like, so I could recall and go back. And um, I basically read all of it yesterday and I completely forgot to take notes. <laughs> Because I was just so happy to be back reading it for like the fourth time. But, yeah, you know. that's like me every time I read a book club book. I'm like I'm gonna take notes and have discussion points, and it's gonna be great. And we did that the first time. Yeah, and... I went way hard on my notes for holes, and then the second time it was like I'm gonna read the book. Hey, okay. <laughs> right. The past few times it's been like I have read the book mostly <laughs> mostly <laughs> we did our jobs good job it's fine but yeah how's yeah. moving castle hi betsy and also everyone else that has already been in here dark and phil and shastow hello welcome to book club if you did not read the book please do not go anywhere we do not kick people out for not reading the book club books we will still you will still be able to enjoy the conversation we will also talk like general book recommendations later on and stuff that does not relate to the book at all. So there you yes. go. It's just chill talking about books time. I'm a bit quiet. I can fix that because I'm on a separate setting in OBS. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Good news. I, I also do want to, uh, it, blah, blah, blah. so Dark has only seen the movie, which is also very valid. Uh, first thing I noticed is that Howl is hot. Correct. <laughs> Howl is hot. Thank you for your input. That's book hug complete. Like, we're good to go. That's I... it. So I saw, going off topic sort of right away, um, I saw the sub when I saw the movie, and I didn't find out until afterwards on the internet that Christian Bale did the voice for Howl in the dub? Yes! Like, I'm going to have to listen to this, because as far as I can tell, in my brain, Christian Bale is only capable of doing the Batman voice, and I can't imagine that's what Howell sounds like, but it's it's an entertaining image. <laughs> I'm, like, trying to bring his voice to mind. Oh, Batman. I think if it could fit. But yeah, no, when I hear the words, like, Christian Bale voice... Definitely the first thing I hear is <laughs> Dark Knight. <laughs> oh, he's British. Okay, he's that so makes a lot more sense. Just British he accent is British. Would, would work, yes. That would work. <laughs> Alrighty then. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Howl is Hot is definitely an impression that I got <laughs> having now only read the book um, and not seen the movie yet. Um so that makes sense i mean I, I i post it like right after we assigned the book i posted a page because mine has bonus has extras inside with the uh including an interview with uh Fine. diana jones and has basically a like she talks about how every 
The one big strange thing about fact about Howell is that almost every young woman who reads about him wants to marry him. I don't, I don't <laughs> think that's true for myself. We, um, I mean, I don't know if we are considered the young woman like range she had in mind. Am I not young enough? <laughs> <laughs> We're not teenagers, is what I'm saying. I'm not yeah, saying, you know, if I'm I was sure 12. there are grown women who read it for the first time and might still be like, ah, oh, I like this guy. But I think your chances increase as your age gets closer to, like, 13. <laughs> yeah. I think it's really interesting that, like, um, heading into spoiler territory now, as soon as so <laughs> Sophie gets aged um, by the curse... I don't know if really that's really that's like the whole that's the whole plot. I wouldn't count that as spoiler. Fair enough. I fair think enough. it's on the back um, of the book. Yeah, on the back cover. So yeah. if it's yeah. in the synopsis, it's not a spoiler. I don't even like read synopses. <laughs> <laughs> not get spoiled sometimes. <laughs> I just want to go in blind. Um, or rather first first playthrough. Oh, yeah. Um <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of things that I read, especially like plot driven stuff. Uh, but anyway, like as soon as she um, becomes an old woman, like she even starts to like think and act like one. So like with this like slightly older woman's perspective on Howl and how obnoxious he truly is and vain, etc. cetera. Um, it, they, they definitely lost me at the like turning point very close to the end of the book um where like you know true feelings are revealed I'm like wait yeah, I guess, where did it, this it, come it, from it, it, that 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 is one of the i mean there's a lot of things about the ed, the ending that feel very like sudden and what is happening um but yeah i don't i mean i don't i don't know that i've ever been like one of those people that were like the old married couple always bantering is like a favorite mm. like ship type you know mm. and that's very much what they you know obviously she is in fact old <laughs> for most of the book even <laughs> if they're not married but just the like bickering i'm just like okay i know that works yeah. for some people that's not yeah. my thing but i don't know the they they saved each other's lives mm -hmm. I don't know, like it's cute, but it's not sexy, you know. Like no. <laughs> you don't get like any any with, sense of tension. I feel that's more what you go it. with with like. <laughs> okay, I was about to say with YA, and then I realized I was drastically wrong about modern YA. Maybe that's more what this is like. Mm. It, you're right, because modern YA does tend to go more for the like sexy side of like yeah. here's our romances, and they're very like tension mm. and hormones and. Lots of lingering more, gazes. Yeah, and this one does <laughs> aim more for the emotional side of stuff. And still feels like a little like, oh, this kind of like was hard to track, but <laughs> But yeah, no, I would not say that sexy is what they're trying to go for. No, right. not even a little bit. I do actually like um I I've I've gotten to read this like so many times the past like couple months because I have nothing else to do uh so um it's one of those things like you don't notice it going like through reading it through the first time but you'll notice it on the second or the third sort of thing um it you'll notice like well okay so first of all he doesn't kick her out which it sounds like he's just like whatever yeah he can kick out this young kid and he's not going to kick out an old woman. But he would have known that, oh, yes, Michael has magical abilities, so I will keep him as an apprentice. Like, he just won't ever say it outright. Same thing with Sophie. Like, he would have noticed right away, oh, she's spelled. So, like, obviously she came to me for help, but can't say anything. So I will try and help her. Hmm. And, like, even though he acts like he hates her and, like, is super annoyed with her all the time, he always does things like, oh, um, like, you want to, like, you want something to do? Well, here's one of my old suits that I don't really wear anymore. It could use some fixing up if you want to do it. Or, um, like, hey, uh, I want your opinion on, like, what kind of house would you like to live in? What would this 
what would you like for this? What would you like for that? That sort of thing. Like. He's a little yeah, bit no, Sundari I... is what I'm hearing you say. Yes. <laughs> I, I, that's a good word for it. Yeah. Say that word again. Sundari. <laughs> It's an anime, like, personality <laughs> term. Teach and it... me the anime words. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, basically, it means, like, you know, acts very cold and aloof, um, but, like, is secretly warm on the inside, and, like, you start, like, melting them over the course of the show, usually. But I, it's not like I like you, Baka, is the, like, stereotypical <laughs> sentence that people kind of <laughs> ascribe to that. But, yeah, so just that giving off trying to give off the impression they're not that interested or not that connected when it's just like i can't show my true feelings <laughs> mm -hmm. okay got it i know the type <laughs> oh yeah no they're in books all the time but <laughs> yeah 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 but there is more that i'd like to say on the matter but like i don't know how spoilery we can get right away and i'm really bad at like remembering when things are in fact spoilers <laughs> So I'm trying to hold back, but because I know it's fine. Like, you can just like throw out a quick spoiler alert, and people can mute the stream for a minute <laughs> if they don't want to hear it. <laughs> that's that's very. I can throw up an image later. Yeah. I can throw up like an image text and make it. A, I'm gonna do that. You keep talking. Do the vis the verbal one right now. But I'm gonna <laughs> add some text. <laughs> oh nice. boy. Nice. Okay, so like just this is a huge freaking spoiler. Like very end of the book, very end of the movie. Um, so you find out that the deal that Howell <laughs> made with Calcifer is that he literally gave him his heart. And so, like, one, uh, Howell can't express himself properly because he physically does not have a heart. But also, Sophie spends most of her day with said heart, which also implies that, like, he probably has feelings for her because she's always constantly near it and like I don't know how to explain myself further from here. No, I, I, I understand what you mean and I that did not occur to me to me in the slightest for some reason. Like yeah. that's a real like light bulb moment for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and like uh, Calcifer like pretty much liked her from the get-go. It was like, oh, Calcifer doesn't like anyone. It's just like... There was oh, one how line... Is how... That's just... Okay. <laughs> like, most of the way through, I can't remember where exactly it came up um, or, like, even what exactly they had said, but um, I never quite worked out what they meant when somebody made a comment about like, the there was a reason why Sophie was like so reluctant to go see her sisters or to um leave the castle at all and i never quite pieced together what that was yeah i th um, i thought that i thought that uh not wanting to see her sisters was just like another aspect of her um like self-deprecation sort of like that's connected yeah. to her being stuck as an old lady past whole house ability in the first place like but yeah i don't yeah I'm definitely sure is another possible. kind of aha moment Cause, like obviously you could tell in the beginning that she was kind of starting to like curse herself um when she was, she said that she looked like an old maid, and then she started acting like a quote unquote old maid, um, but never really it didn't click until closer to the end um, that the witch's spell was really just like amplifying, like really the insecurities that Sophie had cast upon herself yeah. um, from the beginning, and really only thing holding Sophie back was herself. Oh no. <laughs> I would say it's a perfect, like, you know, if you have, I, you know, okay, hope Sophie believes anything and it happens. Like, you, someone mm -hmm. gives you that description, you'd be like, ah, Sophie, too OP, please nerf. And it's like, no, the nerf is that that applies to stuff you believe about yourself, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And also, for the longest time, she just, like, doesn't even understand um, 
how it's all working. So that's something that I definitely hope gets explored in future books is just kind of seeing Sophie like really learning to manage her own power. Right. Like, um, I mean, yeah. even towards the end of this one, we start seeing her like, you know, at the height of her, like actually being able to control, th being able to like be more intentional about stuff. Um, even if it's hard to, <laughs> when you get really angry or that, that makes stuff difficult, but <laughs> Yeah, Oops, she stops and flowers. thinks for a moment before she acts and speaks. <laughs> and it makes a difference. Yes. Imagine that. <laughs> I mean, she is pretty dense about that kind of thing, too. Like, she didn't think about that until Howell told her, like, you need to stop and think. She didn't realize um, that she was a witch until she was literally told, you're a witch. Like, by multiple people. Like, right. Uh -huh. you, would, you would think she would have picked up with the hats, like... You made that scarecrow I... come to life. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Poor Sophie. Very little self-awareness going on there. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. So, uh, this is... Uh, it kind of goes back to the very beginning. Like, one of my favorite things about the story is that, like... They're very aware about magic and, like, fairy tales and all that, and they just insist on, like, well, I guess, like, it's more of something that the older generation does compared to, like, her younger sisters, where she and, like, Fanny believe in the rule of threes, uh, which is very prominent in, like, fairy tales, where, like, if there's three here, or if there's, like, three sisters, the youngest one is going to be, um, like the best out of the three. She's going to be the hero or the princess or, like, the one who saves the kingdom, that sort of thing. Or, like, the three little pigs. The last pig is always going to be the smartest because they were the last and they were so-and-so. And, yeah. And, like, they even mention, um, because Martha is only their half-sister, that would imply that they're uh, she and Letty are supposed to be right, the evil. ugly step or like stepsisters, yeah. ass sisters. It's it is like I've never like I mean you get like meta. Well, actually, I'm trying to think how many books actually do like people aware of the genre they're in. Like you get plenty of books that you know will take tropes and twist them on their head, but that's still on just like the writer's level. There's not usually like I am aware I live in a fairy tale world and these are the rules of fairy tales and that's just how it's going to be yeah exactly except by the end of the book you know it's not actually oh like that's that's garbage like it doesn't actually happen like that like right. i literally i think howell literally calls it garbage <laughs> and yeah your destiny is not prescribed yeah um, yeah yeah, definitely a lot of messages in the book about, you know, finding your own voice and your own power. Um, and Phil is asking a great leading question for us in the chat. Um, what do we make of how all three sisters change how they look at the beginning um, with Sophie's sisters turning into each other, of course, and then um, everyone gradually or very suddenly changing <laughs> back over time i mean um, sophie's appearance was very sudden but i don't know yeah <laughs> yeah i don't know that. though i i think that a part of sophie's transformation like was already kind of like an immediate transformation of her personality like we kind of touched on before too and then really like her her journey through the book is i think she's kind of meeting herself halfway there because she's she's both you know trying to de-age but she's also maturing at the same time and so like even though like old witch sophie is like grumpy and sassy in a way that we don't really see uh young sophie ever outwardly being um she she's finding like the, the her her journey is kind of finding that happy medium like where where her voice really is not just like being a cranky old lady but right. like you know expressing her snarky sassy side 
it's, but maybe not quite as aggressively. It's interesting <laughs> you say that because um, in the movie, when she changes back at the end, her hairstyle is silver. Like, she is mm-hmm. young again, but her hair, like, is gray. Like, that's its new permanent color. So that almost, like, that'd be, like, a physical representation of, of what you're saying. And yeah. I definitely did not uh, consider it that way when I saw the movie, so... Yeah, but it's definitely an interesting point, too, um, that Phil's kind of pointing out with both of her sisters also experiencing um, voluntary but still transformations um, and kind of assuming each other's identities. Um, And I I guess those, like, assumptions of different identities allow each of the sisters to go on the different journeys that they really want to be on, you know? Right. Sophie kind of seemed like she always did really want to go out and seek her fortune, but it wasn't for her because she was an eldest child. Right. The, um, the assumption of failure and the, the curse kind right. of gave her that like, well, I, 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 I can't stay here. I guess I better go do something like, right. Yeah. yeah but like Martha <laughs> wanted to fall in love and have 10 children and <laughs> she's going to get that in the end. And Letty wanted to continue studying and, um, but become someone really smart and so she found her her skills in studying witchcraft um and so i guess like the the transformation for each of um the sisters in the story is really the catalyst for you know being able to even just start going on those journeys and like break free from the um the assumptions that they'd all been operating in about their roles in their household and society that Ilya was talking about before. I'm trying to decide how, like, the story would play out differently for the sisters, if not on a bigger level, if, like, instead of doing the magic to make themselves look like each other, if they just, you know, when Fanny was like, I've done this and I've done this, be like, no, actually, I'm going to go there and she's going to go there. Okay, cool, bye. (laughs) Yeah, because, like, nobody seemed to care <laughs> once <laughs> they realized what had happened. Annie certainly didn't really seem to care. She Mrs. Just... Fairfax didn't care. She's like, it's the sister that came to me wants to learn? Cool. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I think Martha did touch on it briefly towards the beginning, where, um, like, she was saying to Sophie, uh, like, oh... Fanny doesn't really care about us. She just wanted, like, she sent Letty to a place where she's going to meet a lot of male suitors because she's the prettiest. And so, obviously, like, she just wanted to send her off to get married. And because I'm way too young for that, she sent me off to go on learning because you and her agree that because I'm the youngest, I have to, like, go and earn my fortune or whatever, but I just want to have ten children. Yeah, no, it probably was more just the the path of least resistance to just be, like, to have the subterfuge involved. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, like, truly, it seemed like the way that Fanny made those choices was, like, what seemed like the path of least resistance to her, too, at the time. Like, well, this seems sensical, so here, here they go. Um, Phil also points out, um, he thinks the moving castle going back to the hat shop was also a big part of what I was talking about. And I'm not sure which piece of what I was talking about you're um, referring her to. coming half, like, way, I think? The... Oh. She did say, like, she had, she, blah, blah. She didn't want to take over the hat shop, like, it was very... Right. Uh, she didn't like interacting with customers. She didn't really care about any of that. She just no. wanted to, wanted to do something else. She didn't like making hats. Yeah. 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 But then, like, when they move back in, and you know, Hal gives her the opportunity to decide um, what she wants the shop to be, um, and like, even like really just totally leaves it up to her. And so in retrospect, you know, Hal probably knew for sure that (laughs) this is the shop that um, Sophie was supposed to inherit. So I I do think it's really cool that he like goes out of his way to kind of put that agency back on her. Like, so obviously you don't want this to be a hat shop, but 
what should it be now? And she wants it to be flowers. And then she gets to, you know, start experimenting with her magic and growing different plants oh. um, and flowers. Yeah. That, that also just reminded me of another way that, you know, that like, we know that Howell liked her early on uh, because when um, Percival, I suppose that that's what he was called for a little while, went out and said, Oh, like these flowers didn't actually used to be here. It was, just bushes so howell had gone out and made that entire area of flowers just because she said that she liked flowers and wanted more flowers i would say that is the most romantic part of that book to me i think just like <laughs> all the so many flowers like i there is a flower field in like the movie but i want to say it was just one of the default like exits to the to, to the one on one of the door settings and or it wasn't it honestly it didn't look impressive enough regardless i'm just like okay there need to be about 12 different more types of flowers um it does look <laughs> like yeah <laughs> uh, i love the quote that hermione points out too she says not related but it's her new favorite insult um i hope your bacon burns <laughs> very Classic. cruel fate indeed <laughs> Uh, yeah no but coming back to what you were saying Trina I definitely talking through this now I think that the most romantic piece to me for sure is um that he he let her choose what she wanted her vocation to be going forward and then you know helped give her the tools to make that happen I think that's pretty cool <laughs> um speaking of the doors hold on I'm gonna throw the spoiler alert up. <laughs> Whales! <laughs> yeah, I love like I think that would count as a reverse isekai, maybe or no, this would just be a nor like you're you're on the other side of point of view. Isekai, by the way, I'm throwing out more anime terms. Um Chilla Mags <laughs> is the gen it's basically like it's portal fantasy. It's like, oh, here I am, this person from our world, and oops, I've been sucked into this other magical world. And so, okay. I mean, Howl is essentially an Isekai protagonist, but we're seeing this from the point of view of the other world, and then you go back and you're just like, oh, hey, this looks familiar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and you see that, you see that in other fantasy stories occasionally and it's always kind of funny and a little jarring whenever they like do that you know you've been in this high fantasy world for a while and then all of a sudden they like cut open a window and um like oh this is our world like the um the his dark materials series um does that you spend like a whole book in some change um in one world that's like very clearly not this world um but then you meet some characters who obviously are from this world and um uh, i like how straightforward they're, they're... they were about it in this one though like i mean you know initially yeah. going in like the describing of the clothes they're wearing is a little like how does the fantasy world describe skinny jeans um, but, like, after that, it's just like, nope, the shirt just says Welsh Rugby, this is Wales, hello, this is a school, like, you know, what's, they, they don't, like, try to be like, ooh, what is this mysterious place for so long? It's just, we're here, <laughs> hello. Yeah, yeah, I did, I did kind of notice how, like, readily Sophie and Michael just accept that, oh, yeah, okay, this door went into a different world. I mean, after the I other, like, after you <laughs> already had the castle, like, I don't know how much more surprised you could True. be by stuff, really, but. True, yeah, yeah. But I'm, then I'm describing that... the, like, the magic boxes on the wall. <laughs> It's a TV. It's always funny. Also, where is my magic uncle that will make me my own video games at a moment's notice? <laughs> Please. Yeah, he can just whipped that out of his pocket, huh? Text based adventure. A game nobody Earth else has ever gotten to play. <laughs> Dream. But yeah, I'm a little I I will not you'll you'll see what they have instead in the movie, Max, but Wales is not in the movie and I am very sad that it is not. It's but I'm gonna leave that out. <laughs> I think Phil just appointed himself your magical uncle. Who... 
Oh, if you have a brand new video. Okay, game. well, I'll tell you what. My first request is I want a uh, I want an indie, a side-scrolling indie game where you play as one of the pack horse librarians that worked in Kentucky during the Great Depression. Yeah. This is my dream indie game. Someone please make it. Okay. Oh, my. Um, okay. <laughs> um, but, yeah, okay, so we've talked about Sophie a bit. We've talked about her sisters. Um, we, we've talked some about Howl, but like you can always talk more about Howl and Calcifer. Howl's hot. <laughs> Howl. Was is what more is there to say? A drama queen is what there is to say. Oh my god. <laughs> yes. Which yeah, I mean, yes. you know, people being dramatic when they're not feeling well is not exactly uh, just the world of book things. <laughs> I'm dying. Yeah. I, I I must say, like, um, Howell's, like, being bored and dying because he has a cold seems like a very, like, male reaction to me. Like, <laughs> it's just, it happens in every piece of media and it happens a lot in real life where they just overreact. Yeah, it's tough, man. The, the one that really stuck out to me, though, is that, like... <laughs> unbridled temper tantrum of like something doesn't <laughs> go my way so i'm going to cover myself in slime like <laughs> that's like the classic temper tantrum where like you're you're like damaging your surroundings and yourself because you're mad <laughs> dude <laughs> Come on. <laughs> All I can say is if I, I would not be able to live with Howl if only for the taking up two hours in the bathroom. I want hot water too. <laughs> Where's my hot shower? There's not gonna be anything left. I mean, Get out. to be fair, <laughs> it's, it's magical hot water coming from like a hot spring, so it should always be hot water. Yeah, there, well, that is that's... the one bright side, I suppose. <laughs> But also, two hours in the bathroom is so excessive. Like, <laughs> or I, more. I, I don't understand. Yeah, I, I don't understand what they're doing. Like, because he's. I mean, I guess he of... had all those like powders and creams that were, you know, presumably like beauty treatments, probably. <laughs> but still, how does that take hours when you've got <laughs> magic to make it happen? Like, I, I don't know. It's either like Sophie definitely describes it early on as like extreme vanity but like that's also belies like quite a bit of insecurity as well if you oh, yeah. can't feel confident going out in public unless you are <laughs> two hours in the bathroom and then you know Ilya pointing out that Howell doesn't have a heart for most of the book um, does also just like makes me wonder how much that plays into his like perceived vanity at that point as well or you know insecurity that would be related i do we mm -hmm. i don't remember well okay i guess he can't have i guess he can't be that much older than he looks because his sister over in wales isn't like oh how weird that like you should be 50 and look 20 still but yeah you know, and she's we, totally we saw older with the sister. witch like yeah. i mean you know it, it the concern was that howl and Howlsifer were going to start going the way of the witch and her fire demon and like we see that with the witch it's you know she's mm -hmm. a thousand years old and she's just like obsessed with i have to be the pretty one i have to be the young one i cannot be the only young pretty one like mm -hmm. so maybe that is Hard to say how much is personality and how much it was a symptom of, of that connection. Yeah. But. Also, it really felt like the defeat of the witch. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. I'll be back up. Yeah, <laughs> we'll throw it okay. up there. Spoiler alert. Um, the, the defeat of the witch itself feels like very anticlimactic. You know, it's just they show up and it's not even Howl or Sophie. It's the scarecrow that winds up doing her in and like we we don't really get an opportunity to like learn anything about her motivations beyond she's like i want to make the franken man and you're like oh, oh okay that's the like, super messed up <laughs> yeah. dude but I but kind why <laughs> i kind i kind of read that at that point as like 
I'm not really sure how much of the witch was left, like, personality-wise, and how much she was just, like, a shell or a puppet of the fire demon. Like Then the fire demon's motivation is just, like, seeking power, so, like, pulling the different pieces of powerful men together, I guess, to Um, make a puppet king? I don't really know. The witch did say that, uh, like, she was going to piece together, like, she was going to make the perfect looking man because like she had to be the prettiest so obviously her husband would have to be the prettiest because it was originally the prince who would then become the king and then she would become the queen so it was definitely like a big power move but also like having him be the prettiest person like trophy husband kind of thing but also like it wouldn't make a lot of sense because she's a thousand years old and she like she's completely gone by this point like her plan doesn't make sense because most of it is what the fire demon wants and what the fire demon wants is uh howl's heart because like if he just jumps over to that one uh the demon gets to live longer yeah it almost like i could almost see i it's hard to tell how much the witch and the fire demon and her fire demon were like able to communicate with each other but i almost wonder if it was like there was an idea the, the, like, piecing together bit was an idea that the fire demon put in the witch's head as a ruse to get, like, how to her. Like, because, mm. I mean, the witch obviously would not be interested in, like, oh, hey, by the way, I'm dumping you for this guy because he's not a thousand years broken. Like, so, I don't know. That's that's my theory. There's, there's only so much information to go on. I feel like it could be read a few ways, but... Uh, the, the one thing, like, uh, I actually had a lot of questions what, uh, with, so Ben Sullivan, he would be, like, he was one of the other other wizards, and uh, he also apparently came from Wales. Right. But um, Miss Artagon, which, okay, huge spoiler, Miss Artagon. I still have it up, it's fine. <laughs> okay. Um, is actually the fire demon, but she lives in Wales. For... Well, well, we she we only had her word for it that Ben Sullivan was her fiance. Yes. Like, as far as I could tell, no one like you know that's a nice like cover. No one in Wales actually had to verify her. Um, I'm sure she has only been there for so long. Um, yeah, but yeah, I do. And... I do wonder. I'm like, okay, where? Who made this first like portal between our world and? the world of Ingrid and like how how did all this get started we don't unless that's right. a just and, yeah. one of the and the ones. witch gets access to wales because she pulls the knowledge of wales out of wizard solomon slash ben sullivan's head um so that kind of opens the door i right. think like she wasn't yeah it doesn't go. sound like she was the one who like initiated this this was Ben Sullivan was the first one that made the jump somehow, and yeah. we don't know how he did it. But it's um, yeah, well, but I think like the wizard Solomon was definitely the link for you know how the fire demon was able to go implant themselves yes. in Wales. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, it does actually confirm that Howell would have to be, like, in his 20s or maybe 30s. Because Solomon came first. He didn't make contract with the Fire Demon, so this guy is, like, 30s or 40s, maybe, because he came first. And then Howell came after. So he would still have to be, like, actually a young guy. Right. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he seems, like, really well. I mean, I don't know. Lots of things seem to happen quickly in this book, but Hal seems, like, really well established in his different nooks of the world for how, like, short he's presumably been here. Like, I mean, okay, well, okay, I say short. I suppose I don't know how long he studied under um, Mrs. Penstemon, but, like, there was a training section, apparently, before he became the big bad of uh, market shipping. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Well, we know that the castle itself hadn't been 
hovering around the town for very long before the like events of the book really take off. Um, so I think it's conceivable that, you know, he'd only had to spend a couple of years. And I think he and Calcifer had been together for five years. Is that right? Um, they definitely yeah. say how long right. towards the end of the book. Just a bit. Sorry, you said hovering and that reminded me like, oh, right, there, <laughs> there aren't legs in the book. No, <laughs> that's, that's no. That was something that definitely phase. threw me in watching the trailer for the movie. Were you surprised by Miyazaki's vision of the castle and characters of Howl's Moving Castle? I was surprised by the moving yes. castle because I had not thought of the castle having feet. In the book I wrote, the castle is more like a hovercraft and floats an inch or so above the ground. <laughs> but I am very fond of Miyazaki's castle. I have several models around <laughs> of it around the house. <laughs> Just from, like, what I can see in the trailer, and we could, like, launch into talking about the movie um, oh, soon, boy. too. Um, but it definitely looks, like, a lot more steampunky than I was really imagining in my head. I don't know if that's yeah, true or I not. I mean, I don't know. It's Miyazaki. I feel like he has to make everything look, you know, interesting, if not pretty. Not everything in Miyazaki yeah. films are pretty, but they definitely have to be visually interesting. Hmm. I will say, like, the only really steampunky element to the actual movie would be the castle. Like, everything else is very medieval England kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, fantasy medieval. So it's a bit different. Yeah. Yeah, no, the movie definitely ends up feeling a bit more traditionally fantasy. Like, you don't get the, like, interesting, like, meta flavors of the book. You don't get the world hopping. You don't get... you. I don't understand the purpose of the black door. He just, he just, he doesn't do anything. He just goes and he looks no. and angsts. <laughs> Look how bad war is. I get it, Miyazaki. You already did this in like at least four <laughs> of your other movies. They don't all have to be about how war sucks. Yeah, like definitely first time I ever watched the movie, it was amazing. It was beautiful. Like it became my favorite film instantly. Then I read the book and I began to notice all the things wrong with the movie. And then you're like, oh, this doesn't actually... Yeah, no, I... Yeah. I, I think uh, I've seen... I've only seen like four or five Miyazaki films at this point. And I feel like Castle in the Sky is about the only one that like had an ending that felt like it made sense and wasn't 30 seconds long. Um... Uh, I would say, like, the ending to Spirit Away, like, it makes a lot of sense, but leaves a lot to, like, be desired, I suppose, if that makes sense. That's that's not one of the five I've seen yet, but... <laughs> I, 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 I could tell immediately as soon as you, like, didn't react. I'm like, ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no. Mononoke is the one I saw most recently, and that was the mm -hmm. one where I was just like, okay, yeah. but we're right back where we started. <laughs> you didn't change anything. Nobody changed their minds. They're just going to start fighting later. They... <laughs> Yay, wolf girl, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> so what what changes do y'all think um, between the book and the movie do work for the story and the, the way that things play out? Um, gosh, now I'm trying to remember. Oh, boy. More details about the movie. Uh, the way that they do the Witch of the Waste is very interesting. Um, she's not at all like the book, and they sort of, like, okay, so instead of, like, Mrs. Pear, sorry, I can't remember the entire name, uh, Howell's mentor, basically. Yeah. Oh, Petstemon? Yes. Instead of, like, being Howell's mentor in the book, book uh so in the movie she's she basically works for the king and like deals with the witch of the waste herself hmm. it's yeah it's i don't know like there's a lot of things that like change completely from the movie to the book or from the book to the movie i mean and um while a lot of it like if you're thinking of the book specifically, they don't quite make sense. Um, there's also a few things in general that just don't make sense if you, like, miss one, like, random line somewhere. That's um, not translated in your subs. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Right. 
but uh, I think like for what they did with the Witch of the Waste, I think it worked out well for what they did with her, because well, for one thing, she doesn't really die, but she they don't ever mention that she has a fire demon. She's just a really like crazy witch, and hmm. by the, end of the movie, like she no longer has her powers. Yeah, they hmm. do. They they definitely make her more like. I don't know if sim like I I guess sympathetic like you do more or less like I guess she more or less still has the mo- same motivations of like I want to be young I want to be pretty I want to be powerful, but yeah she, I mean again she still exists by the end of the movie so she has that going for her um <laughs> um gosh the only the only other major difference I can remember from the movie all of a sudden is just like. Sophie's sisters don't exist. Ah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> really? Oh, that's too um, bad. You briefly know that they exist because Sophie goes to visit Letty, but it's literally like, oh, hey. And then they talk for a total of five seconds, and then she goes back to work, and then you never hear about them ever again. Oh, um, I will. Or- so, uh, so the it, house house introduction is is more memorable of the movie. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Like that entire first scene, like it made me fall in love with Howell. But also, that sort of same scene does happen at the end of the novel as well. It's just he didn't do his hair. He didn't do his like skin potions or whatever, and like his clothes are all tattered. But it's the same thing, just, you know, Sophie's old and not pretty. Right, but I mean, I you know, there's you know, what, one makes a much more striking image for the impressionable young <laughs> teenage viewer. It's just like, ah, oh, this magical man just swooped her into the air. I like where this is going. <laughs> yeah, I really do like the addition of, like, him saving her from like a bunch of um like mildly drunk men just trying to hit on her and she's just like no thank you and then they uh like they're trying to press on with it and then he just like whoop but then you know suddenly she's in trouble because he just got her involved with his problems yeah that actually has oh hold on i'm like i feel like the witch cursing her by act actually makes more sense in the movie too because she um, did inter- interact directly with Howell, whereas yes. this is just like you do magic hats, you are a co- you are now a competition. Bye bye. <laughs> oh no no, uh, there's there's more to it. Than I that. know, but like the the impression that you get early in the story, yeah. <laughs> right? It does feel pretty random. Like, oh, this is the catalyst that is setting our <laughs> our heroine on her adventure. Alrighty then. <laughs> yeah. The the I guess it's not quite the call to action or whatever, but kind of is. It's the pushing out the door. Right. I'm trying to think of a good like synonym but not synonym for call. <laughs> right. Right. The, the, I mean, the grumble to adventure. I don't know. <laughs> it does sort of make sense, though, that she's like, well, time to leave home. Because literally, like, oh, well, my very young not mother will not recognize me anymore. So I had better get out of uh, this place before she, like, calls the, I don't know, fantasy police? I don't know what they have there. Guards? I feel like awesome. constable is a like, word that comes to mind. I don't think it was actually in the book. I just think of that as being the fantasy equivalent. I don't know. But, yeah. I think maybe guard. Maybe they just uh, don't have police. <laughs> I mean, you, you learn magic, and then if someone does stuff you don't like, you magic them, I guess. Like you do. <laughs> So obviously we just read the one, and if you liked it, which I hope you did, there are the two, which are not, it's, I don't want to call it a trilogy, because they're not really sequels, 
but they kind of are, but they're not. They're you moved them the too fast. We couldn't see oh, the sorry. titles. Uh, Castle in the Sky and the Air. Sorry. Castle is the next one. No relation to the Ghibli film in this case. Um, <laughs> and then uh, House of Many Ways. And they take place in the same like world as Howl's Moving Castle. Because Ingri, which is where Howl's happens, is just one country in the world of magic that we're introduced to. Um, I haven't actually read House of Many Ways, but Castle in the Air. Um, did I mention the name of the place? It's it's um, it's like a Middle Eastern equivalent type country. Um, but yeah. So do you call these like companions rather than sequels? Maybe. I, I was always under the impression mm. that companions like happened at the same time as other books and just from different no. points of views, but... No. Okay, so it's, yeah. It's kind of weird <laughs> in the way that, like, so it, like, they are, it's a direct sequel, but Howell and Sophie aren't the main characters, if that makes sense. So, like, they're still in the books. This is, like, time has passed. Uh, like, the world is continuing to go, but they just aren't the main characters. Same thing. That makes sense. Book. They've had their adventure. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I'm, they continue to have more adventures. It's just, oh, they're just side characters in these other ones. Wait, hold on. I should be able to. Fi- I should be able to figure out exactly how many years later this one happens because I forgot that Princess Valeria is in here, and she's what one in this book. Yes, <laughs> and I think like, she's like. I mean, she's still a kid, but she's like. She's old enough to understand other people and speak properly, and like. She's a very smart little girl. I feel like she was around like five or something. Yeah. In the second book. They mean uh, oh in the second book. Yes. Oh okay no they name her about four years old in okay. Castle of the Sky. So this happens three years later. <laughs> huh. And then the third book, you also get that sort of timeline uh, with another child who is also around like four to five years old. Oh, interesting. All right. That you, that you will be meeting. I'm, I'm trying not mm-hmm. to spoil it because I know I Trina appreciate that. that. <laughs> <laughs> I am not Yeah, and I think Hermione's right. Kind of like a spinoff. <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah. I... Yeah. That, that would make the most sense. Yeah. That works. But, so, yeah. one, one thought that I, I sort of had, like, with uh, the entire world is, like, it's a very parallel, like, modern day like earth except it's just like set in a different time period that has magic and everything because like the way that it's written it feels very like ingre is very like wales and slash or england and um then there's like the literal like aladdin's-esque uh middle um middle eastern area then the third book it feels very English, but also not. So I was like, oh, well, this is like Scotland. And like, the main character sounds like she'd be from Scotland. Like, even her description mm-hmm. makes it sound like Scotland. I'm like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. So it's literally Earth, but not Earth. Because Earth is like a different dimension. Mm-hmm. Like those uh, sci-fi, I haven't... I know like in comics sometimes, the, when you have the different... Er- parallel dimensions and they just like number, label them with earth numbers they're like this is earth 8 this is earth 73 <laughs> yeah exactly like that yeah i think it's it's kind of common for fantasy to borrow from like kind of cultural tropes um to i don't know just kind of help us frame the differences in cultures that exist within the fantasy world. Um, like I've been playing Witcher 3 recently and you know, after spending 20 hours or something in like the mainland, then we went off to this island named Skellige that's rocky and gray and they have a lot of sheep and I was like, oh, we're in Scotland, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The customs on this island are very Scottish sounding. Right. Um, They're sort of skipping ahead in the world building as it was. <laughs> right. But it, it kind of it helps us like infer a lot of things about the cultures that we encounter in the stories. Um 
So it, it's almost kind of like a shortcut instead of having to like flesh out a whole different culture. You can use those like signifiers um, so that the reader is able to use knowledge that we already have about our world and the cultures that exist here um, to kind of like fill in the gaps around what you're able to actually like paint in a picture with your words or, you know, assemble in a video game. So it, I think it's, it's a handy tool for storytellers to use, to be able to kind of like map cultures from, you know, our earth into fantasy worlds. Which made me come to think of it why I can, like, fantasy and sci-fi are grouped together as a genre so often, but I find I, like, I, I gravitate to fantasy way more often than sci-fi, and that might be why, because it's really yeah. hard to do the equivalent thing in sci-fi, like. Totally. If, like, if it's not different enough, it almost, like, isn't sci-fi in the first place, but. Right. Yeah. And like so much of sci-fi is, you know, like discovering alien species and um, the like point of those interactions so much is to like really examine our experience with like xenophobia and um, the fear of the unknown. And in order to do that, like you do have to kind of make it unknown, like (laughs) unknowns. Yeah. Whole new, whole new species. Um, that that are much more difficult um, to relate to in general. Right, I'm like so, where's just my my off brand? Yeah. I I'll take my off brand. Um, again, off brand Scotland. It's just like I, I feel I feel <laughs> right. at home. You can change whatever the heck you want, but I have a starting place that I feel I feel comfortable. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Uh, mm. Do you guys have more you want to talk about the book, or do we want to talk about other books and stuff we've been reading recently? Because I definitely thought of a book that I I read before our last meeting, and I was like, I forgot to tell people about it, and I hate when that happens. <laughs> well, tell us about it now. Okay, what at is least that book I'm pretty sure I didn't. Um, so during during the side quest run, I mentioned um, the Temerar series by Naomi Novik as a series I enjoyed and that I recommended. Um, she has just started a magical school, um, like genre series. Um, the first book is called A Deadly Education and it's, it sort of strips away a lot of the like idealism of like other, cause like, okay, obviously Harry Potter is sort of our prime example of magical school books and like for as dangerous as like the world is like the only danger at Hogwarts seems to be related to like Voldemort like adjacent stuff. And there's not like you live in a world of like dragon. Like where do we hear about just like random kids getting eaten in the countryside by dragons? Like surely that must be happening, mm-hmm. but we don't hear about it. Um, so in this world, um, when magic kids hit puberty, basically they start like just their raw aura draw like magic aura starts drawing monsters um so actually like it's just a really dangerous time to be alive um but you know you still need to like prepare them for this dangerous life so they have the school and but then then you have all the teenagers in one spot so the monsters get drawn even more and eventually you get to the point where they're this the graduation rate of the school translation survival rate of this school is 25 percent but that's actually still better odds than if you like go off and live by yourself like and it's not like it's not done in a grim dark sort of way it's just it feels more like survival book like you know kids kids i the the survival genre is always a perennial favorite among kids it's just like oh surviving natural disasters and it feels a little bit like that flavor wise um like you get like the kids you know ultimately like they're usually looking out for themselves they do make alliances but it's not for the most part it's not kids like actively trying to kill each other grim dark stuff um so like that's the world and then you have our main character who is has a very strong um affinity for like very big destruction magic but she really does not want to be like evil villainous 
but like the magic that the school kind of like is trying to push her it's like here i taught you a spell for like melting a person and she's like i asked for a spell to clean my floor <laughs> Um, also her mom is, like, basically a magical hippie, so that's just another layer of, it's, it's very, it, it was very entertaining, I thought. Um, it is, the, the, she's not the most likable of main characters. I know some people, like, can get a little turned off if, like, the main character feels like she's complaining a lot, or, but, so, heads up on that going in, but, like, with good reason, honestly, in this case, I think. Um, but yeah, A Deadly Education by, by Naomi Novik. My review. <laughs> yeah. So, just, I, I looked this up while you were uh, talking about it, because it does sound right up my alley. And uh, on Goodreads, the first two, like, the little section that says, readers have also enjoyed, the first two books are Howl's Moving Castle and The Wizard really? of the Really? <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I haven't actually read the Earthsea series myself, but that's another, um, book that got turned into, like, a Studio Ghibli movie, so, like, I assume it's gonna be a good book as well. Yeah, no, I definitely want to read Try Earthsea at some point on my very yeah. long list of working in a library. Your to-read your to -read list gets <laughs> longer twice as fast! All the time. <laughs> yeah. All the time. Yeah. Um, but sometimes also you find little gems that you might never have considered otherwise. And I don't know, something about what you were describing, Trina, put me in mind of a short novella that I read several years ago um, called Every Hearted Doorway by um, Shannon McGuire. Um, and... It's definitely an adult book, um, but it is in the like tradition of the like magical schools um, for teens, except uh, this one has the twist of this school is like a special school um, for kids who have like fallen through into other worlds and then come back. Oh. Um, to the real world um and this book um like really examines the trauma that comes along i would say that there's, a, there's an xkcd <laughs> that makes fun of that i don't know if i can uh -huh. out right yeah but like to, there's people who've gone sure. to wonderland and um people there's who've what? gone to like a steampunk like jekyll and hyde type world and um uh like there's there's an underworld represented as well, um, but it is. I'm definitely gonna take a look at this web comic. Uh, <laughs> but I really I really enjoyed the story and the kind of the spin on you know sometimes your magical journeys don't necessarily leave you more whole afterwards. You know sometimes they they take something from you that you can't really ever get back. Um, and you know, you, you are forever going to be changed because of this experience. Um, and so it's, it's a short read and a, a really quick one. Um, but very poignant. Um, and I really enjoyed the, the different take on it. And I know that she's, um, published like follow-ups to, that one since then it, it's um, listing it as number one on goodreads out of you know a series of some sort so yeah but yeah no yeah. i recognize i recognize the cover so i must have seen this at some mm -hmm. point but yeah no i will probably read that one again you know when i don't know <laughs> get, get in line <laughs> yeah it's it's pretty much <laughs> Pretty much that exact plot of the webcomic <laughs> that you shared. Oh, that's funny. I'll put the name in chat. I also uh, added my own webcomic that, like, I've actually... I haven't... I'm not all caught up with it, but I'm a big fan of uh, the creators, first of all. And they have a similar sort... Like, that has a similar sort of feel, except... Um, uh, the the characters are people who get pulled in are called the namesake. 
also like you might get pulled into a book because you're Alice and you have to go through the entire story of mm-hmm. Alice and Land, and then you get returned. But obviously, like you can't talk about that to normal people. So they like created an entire like um, company basically to be like, "Hi, we are here to help you." Like we are the because a lot of <laughs> yeah, exactly. And yeah, it's very dangerous and like. Um, magical objects are leaking out of the store like these fairy tales because people take them with them when they leave and it's it's a very interesting story and they're up to apparently seven books already which i didn't realize i think i'm on like book three (laughs) so i'm very behind just means you don't have to worry about running out as quickly also true yeah that is the benefit of (laughs) reading things more slowly these days too you can savor them (laughs) it's uh also the same thing that i do with like with a lot of anime i've fallen back into anime again which terrible decision really um because now i'm like i started watching things that came out in like 2014 so they are completed and i'm very excited to go through them but you know, that's at least, like, a good seven, eight years of shows that I haven't watched yet. And they pump these guys out. So I always get recommendations, just like I also get book recommendations and movie recommendations and, like, recommendations for everything. And I want to look at them all, I want to read them all, I want to watch them all. Never going to, but, like, because I've been watching so much anime again, I have not been reading books but I have an entire pile of books I've been like, ooh, I want to read those now, too. There's only so much time in the world. Yeah. It's hard. (laughs) Yeah. No, that's that's a hard... I mean, again, in any form of media, it's it's hard when you come to the realization that more more is getting produced than you can keep up with, and just making that... That's... That's how you come to embrace the concept of did not finish on books. If you give it, feel like you've given the book a fair shot and you don't like it, you don't have to finish the book. There's more you books don't. out there. You don't. Is that's that's actually true. I don't. I don't. That doesn't have to be happen to me very often. Like I feel like I have no. pretty low standards for books, but like, um, oh gosh, what was it? There was some. It's it's a middle grade book, and I don't actually remember the name, but um, it was a mermaid series, and I got like the the third book had a image of a um. A Chinese mermaid in the oh gosh I never remembered how to pronounce the name of the dress the sh- shingo sum the like Mandarin color uh-huh. thing and I was just like non-white mermaids what and like I I does seem like the world she built was very big but then I actually tried reading the first book and I'm like oh she's not good at writing oh oh, <laughs> oh. This, is, this is painful dialogue oh that's too bad I'm sorry <laughs> I had such yeah. hopes and you dashed them quite expertly <laughs> Um, for a while, I uh, was a part of this group where um, authors could send you books that they that were about to be published, so you could read them through and write the review, like, basically right as they were coming out. Heck yeah, yeah. Art. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was, like, super cool, and I really wanted to, like, help out authors, but um, I would, like, read a description and be like, wow, that's exactly my kind of book. But then I'd start reading, and the writing quality is so bad that I just, I have to drop it, and I have to say it, like, I'm so sorry, but I won't be reviewing this book because I don't have anything nice to say. (laughs) (laughs) And so I dropped, like, I basically dropped out of that group very quickly because I realized that, like, basically none of the books I was reading were something that... Uh, I would want to actually review. That's interesting that they're, yeah. like, books that were actually getting published and that, like... Because, you know, it's one thing if it's, like, oh, here's this book that I'm trying to get published and, like, yes, a lot of that is going to be not great. I read enough fan fiction to know. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, yeah, I know you would think if they got past the, the... You know, it could be not your thing, but you could still tell if it's, like, well-written even if it's not your thing, but to just be, yeah. like... How, how did this get published? Of course, now we have self-publishing, so. Right, yeah. that's what I was just about to say. It's like, it's kind of a... <sighs> there's there's some sort of balance to it, and I, 
I don't know, I struggle with my own personal prejudice a little bit because I've seen enough self-published books that are like, you really could have used an editor, bro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, like, it's so wonderful that um, folks do not have to necessarily go through all of the barriers and hoops in the, you know, very flawed and we know inequitable publishing industry. Oh, yeah. no, so we... like, it, it's great to have like the ability to publish be more accessible, but at the same time, like there, there are just so many benefits to going through a standard right. publication yeah. process. Of, but you know, no, I, I totally know what you mean. Um, there is a self-published book I asked our collections person to buy for a library and she did um the story there is that it was written by a like you know 11 13 young, older kid um who has uh one of the forms of muscle muscular dystrophy muscular I don't dystrophy. Know the, yeah like, specific mm -hmm. um name for it but she I think which initially she was trying to get American Girl to make one of their girls of the year a like physically disabled. Um, and I think maybe they've done diabetes at this point, but that's about it. Um, and they didn't fight. So she's like, okay, well I'll write my own book with a like main character that has my disability. Um, and none of the publishers would bite because they're like, this girl is too happy. Like, cause her disability wasn't the plot. It was like, and yeah. yeah, no, so her and I think her older sister eventually just went the self-published route. And it was like, really? Really, guys? We're still doing right. this? Yeah. It's like the same thing I've heard, um, you know, BIPOC authors like talking on Twitter about how, like, yeah, own voices is a good thing and like definitely something that we need in terms of representation in the publishing publishing industry. But on the other hand, sometimes publishers use it as a way to like pigeonhole authors of color. Like they throw in a pitch and, um, you know, maybe they don't necessarily want to write a book about, you know, someone who has the exact same experiences that they do. And the publishers will come back and say, we're really looking for own voices work. So if you've got something like that, you can come back to us. It's like, <laughs> you know, the kind of think of it in the same way that like feminism is having right to choose whether you want to go to work or you know stay at home and do the very important labor of raising children um, right not the <laughs> if you are right whereas sometimes it turns into just like oh you want to raise children and stay at home like you're setting us back like I'm like, right. okay, but I'm not telling other people they need to do that. Maybe just I want to do that. Let me do that. <laughs> right. And in the same way, like progress in having representation and diversity in the publishing industry should mean that like we don't have to, you know, stifle the diverse voices and their creativity as well. You know. Speaking of diverse books, I did finish Legendborn. <laughs> Ilya Yay! kept on playing it. I finished it. I'm interested to see where it goes. It, it was definitely so interesting excited. to have, like, the, you know, the fantasy as, I mean, I guess, like, would you consider that urban fantasy? Like? Yes. Cause I would it's, still say it's urban okay. fantasy. I guess urban fantasy can just mean more sort of modern versus traditional fantasy rather than, like, it must take place in a big city, but. Yeah. Yeah just have that the urban fantasy aspects crossed over with the diversity aspects and it was it was I, I liked I liked yeah um random shout out to literary princess who I mentioned before uh I randomly came across her on Instagram the one day while she was cosplaying um oh I can't remember her name oh this is your book cosplayer yeah she cool. was cosplaying a character from um the Percy Jackson series who like nobody ever cosplays because like um like they mentioned so many times that she like this character was a young black girl who lived in Alaska during the 1920s like it was a huge plot point for her so like you never see cosplays of her so I was really excited when I saw it, 
and then like I just started following her and like she did a bunch of other cosplays that I was really excited about like uh Winter from the Cinder series if you haven't read that Lunar Chronicles definitely Lunar read Chronicles that. the Lunar Chronicles so good it, it might it might legitimately be my, be my favorite YA series oh yeah wow I read Cinder <laughs> when it first came out and then never read any of the others but I, I remember really liking it at the time oh it's so good like like I, I i there's like this much of me that's like you know all the every one of the characters ends up like in a relationship and i'm like okay like this is ya this is a little like that that is more or less how it's going to go but mm -hmm. it didn't like it only bothered me like that much <laughs> it, it was it was a good it's a good series mm -hmm. oh uh yeah. Sorry, stepping back a bit. Uh, Piper is uh, the Native American girl who is the daughter of Aphrodite, I believe. Oh, Hazel. Her name is Hazel. Sorry. I only um, ran the lightning thief and then I forgot to read the rest. <laughs> I'll go back some time. <laughs> I read the lightning thief and I didn't read anymore. <laughs> it was good. It was cute. I can uh, definitely see how kids these days totally eat up those books. Um, but, like, you know, I had Harry Potter in my day. and <laughs> Yeah, I was slightly too young to read Harry Potter when the books were, like, were first starting to come out. So I actually didn't read them until I watched all of the movies. But Percy Jackson, I randomly found it in the bookstore one day, and I read the first one, fell in love with it, and then I got the entire series. I got the second series, kind of fell off the train with the third series, because they think it came out like two years ago, and oh boy, it's... Uh... <laughs> That good, huh? <laughs> yeah. It's one of those, ah, uh, yeah, you can definitely see in this one that it's made for younger children now. Mm -hmm. Well, Not and then that, like... we're also getting older, so it's just that more of that divide happens, and it's like, okay, this isn't mine yeah. anymore, that's okay. Yeah. Also, Hermione is in chat sharing our love of a Lunar Chronicles. Yeah. <laughs> I would say, like, I mean, when you start off with Cinderella is a cyborg, like... That's that's a good starting point. Who is a mechanic? Not only a cyborg, a but a mechanic who does her yeah. own maintenance. Like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> in a society yeah. where cyborgs are second class citizens. Like, you just keep adding these layers, and I'm like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, nope. You had me at the last one. You just just shut up and let me read the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, super good. Oh, the Kane Chronicles was also a very good one. Um. So, uh, Rick Riordan wrote so many different series about different mythologies, and now that, like, he's personally run out of, like, the mythologies that he really knows about, he's gotten other authors of, like, people I love color his and imprint, all that. yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely an example of using your privilege and status to elevate the voices of others, like, why not right. slap like, your you know, seal of he, approval? You know, he could, like, he could <laughs> yeah. have decided, oh, I could do yeah. a bunch of research into Indian mythology and I can write books about Indian mythology, but what, like, it was such a better, like, it, it helps on so many more levels to be like, or I can go find Indian authors who already know about this stuff and, like, will do it better than me. Yeah. One I haven't read yet, but I always thought looked really interesting um, was... Arusha and the End of Time by Roshani Chokshi. I think that was one of the first ones that came out in the I imprint. Think so, yeah. Um, but definitely worth shouting out that um, you know, instead of also, yeah. you know, he he told these stories about like the Greco-Roman pantheons, instead of branching out into pantheons from other cultures. Instead, he is choosing to elevate authors from those cultures to write exactly. about um, the mythology from from different parts of the world, and that's super cool. Way to go, Rick Riordan! Oh, Hermione, listen to it. Cool. I need to get back into audiobooks, uh, especially Let's now that I have a five day a week commute instead of my my 
fewer days a week commute. <laughs> but, yeah. but I also like listening to music, and I just, like, go back and forth. I'm like, I haven't listened to books in a while. I'm going to listen to a bunch yeah. of books. And I'm like, I miss, yeah. I miss singing. <laughs> We're about to move um, to a spot that's about 30 minutes away from my workplace. And I work from home for the most part these days, but I won't always. Right. And I'm kind of like psyching myself up to get ready to like listen to a lot more audiobooks in my future. That will be the silver lining to having a longer commute. Because I'll just get to spend more time with books. Exactly. Yay. Right. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't go, want to go much longer than my current commute. Like you get to like an hour yeah. each way and you're like, eh. Ooh, no 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 but like the half hour 45 minutes that's like a good you can Doable. get like a couple chapters done that's a good chunk totally yeah yeah you guys are really trying to like get me back on this train now because i also have a 40 minute drive to work every day like i have audiobooks all ready to go to listen to i just haven't it's a good use of time I love audiobooks for the like passive listening piece um, because sometimes I really do like struggle to sit down and just read a book. But if I can yeah. put an audiobook on, like if I'm going for a run or you know driving somewhere, um, it helps pass the time, helps engage your brain, helps you feel good about like, like yeah, I read a book this week. Yeah. <laughs> I was I was productive. I totally. I, yeah, no, the last audiobook I listened to was the unabridged um Hamilton biography. The 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 one, you know, that inspired Lin Manuel Miranda to do the, the thing. And I was just like it was very and I felt very knowledgeable. I'm like, oh, this is okay, this is where he moved that around for the musical and oh, here's you what you'd really don't get a sense for in the musical is just like how, like you knew that there were a lot of bickering between the two parties, but it's just like, mm, actually, it kind of was as bad as it is today. They just had to had to make their own newspapers to do it instead of hopping on Twitter, basically. Right. It's just like okay, right. if we got this far, survived this far with this uh this level of of fighting, it's like okay, it feels a little bit less like we're about to break into pieces. Yeah, and Hermione is pointing out, um, going back to the like Rick Riordan imprint um, thing, that Patterson has a crap ton of books that like mostly were written by other folks, but Riordan took the classier way and like totally agree because the way that Patterson does it is he uses other authors to like feed the machine of his like personal brand. Yeah, like it'll they're... say James Patterson in the big letters, and then yeah. slightly under it'll be like. And with so and so. Oh, it, yeah with so and so and so and so like it's not it's once it's like half a step above ghostwriting if yeah if they get a byline at all because like he also publishes plenty of books that i'm pretty sure are ghostwritten <laughs> i assume <laughs> you know? the man is writing something but maybe i shouldn't yeah I don't know. yeah whereas like instead of that like rick riordan you know like the the authors get full credit and full billing as the author of the book but he puts like the little seal that looks right. just the, like the thing on the top, the, the branding Rick, Rick that Ryan, goes on uh, all of his books. I don't remember um, the name of the thing, yeah, but... yeah. And so, like, he, he really is just using his name to elevate the work and success of others. It's the way to do it, one hundred percent. Yeah. On the other hand, James Patterson does great work in advocacy and, um, you know, supporting a love of reading. He's pretty passionate about. Um, reaching out to um, uh, less motivated readers, especially in like the middle grades. So, you know, good for him too, I guess. Okay, I keep, see <laughs> I keep seeing posts on Reddit that are like from a social media account that he has that has like pretty good book and library memes, but I can't figure out what platform it's on. The name oh, of funny. the account is just James Patterson Official. But <laughs> I like... It doesn't seem like it's Twitter. I, I don't have Instagram immediately, but like, I don't know. Reddit runs across stuff sometimes, and I'm just like, okay, that's funny. <laughs> where, mm -hmm. where, where can I yeah. subscribe? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, he does make a concerted effort to reach out to reluctant readers um, or, like, readers who haven't found the books that they love yet in, like, the middle grade area. Um, and, like, he's done pretty good work with Chris Grabenstein in that area because that's Chris Grabenstein's real passion too is he writes things that that's are that's the Lemoncello author right 
Yeah, yeah. And they he got his start really um, by co-writing with James Patterson. The, oh gosh, I can like see them on the shelf. It's like the middle school worst years of my life um, books, I think. But anyway, they're like geared at like middle school boys and the purposes to try and you know write some books that they might really enjoy it's a fan account on instagram okay <laughs> yeah no Hermione, you could drop them um in the book club discord um and channel instead some, some book memes later anybody is lurking in chat and wants to join us in our discord we talk about books all month long in between book club there are also other channels means. that talk about non-book stuff i guess and they're okay but you know book club. i guess we talk about video okay. Okay. so I, okay to be fair one talks about zelda so i can't i can't be too hard on that <laughs> <laughs> well trina did you want to treat us to a special segment today yeah, I can do that. So there are obviously a lot of picture books out there. And there are lots of good picture books that aren't like funny. And like the funny ones are what I keep for, you know, the Zelda Thon story times with Trina and for the bumpers and stuff. But I do want to get a little bit of a chance to share some of like just the the sweet ones, the cute ones, the the interesting important ones. And so I, I have brought you I have brought a book for us today. Bonus bonus story time. And Mags will sometimes take over the studio. This is not just just Trina. There, there are other people in this channel. <laughs> um, so I today have grabbed Planting Stories. This is essentially a biography. Um, and it is about uh, Hiro Belpre, who was, who was a New York librarian and basically like, uh, what's the verb I'm looking for? Spearheaded, um, like inclusion of like Hispanic culture at that library. Um, and she has a, the American Library Association's uh, award for like best of um, Latino, Latina authors in children's literature is named after her. It is the, the Pura Belper Award, which this one was an honor book for, I don't remember <laughs> if it was for the writing for the illustration. Sometimes they're split up, but any case, planting stories. And then actually I am going to yeah, you can change the scene to focus. Oh, yeah. well, I was just gonna make our pictures a little bit, my picture a little bit bigger and yours a little bit smaller. That or just, too. or just today, or just this bit. Oh no, I'm behind. Please go in front. I'm breaking. Don't, don't tell them I'm breaking the, uh, <laughs> the layout. <laughs> oh god. Oh god. I'm going rogue. Dark. Close your All eyes. Right. Let me, let me make sure I can figure out the good. Okay, so I guess I'll have to sort of do the two pages separately. All right. It is 1921. Hiro Teresa Belpre leaves her home in San Juan for a visit to Nueva York. Words travel with her. Stories her abuela taught her. Cuentos folclóricos pura retold in the shade of a tamarind tree in Puerto Rico. So here is Puerto Rico. Now a new island stretches before her, ripe for the planting, ripe for planting seeds of the quintos she carries. Manhattan, a city of hustle and bustle, bigger, louded, crowded, yet alive with hope and possibility. What began as a visit to celebrate her sister's wedding becomes the first steps in a new land. Y una nueva vida for for Pura. I can read. She works first in a garment factory, but it is cold floors and hard edges, not the soft fertile ground where seeds take root. Then, a golden opportunity, una benedicción. The library needs a bilingual assistant. Piora speaks Spanish, English, and French. She is perfect for the job. But where are her abuela's stories? 
Not one folktale from Puerto Rico is on the shelves. How lucky for the library that Pura has story seeds ready to plant and grow. In the children's room, she lights the story hour candle and begins. Her eyes dance, her voice sings. Pura's words paint a picture of a little house with a round balcony where Martina, a beautiful Spanish cockroach, meets Perez, a handsome and gallant mouse. El Razontito Perez y la Cucarachita Martina, a tale from the tamarind tree. When Pura's story is done, each child makes a wish on the candle, and with a wisp of air, whoosh, la vela is blown out. Now Pura has a wish too, to plant her story seeds throughout the land. Pura learns to make puppets. She snips and sews their clothes, paints their delicate faces. Families come to hear folk tales in Ingles y Español to watch Pura's puppets dance across the stage of her stories. But the library needs libros for its shelves. How can more children read Perez y Martina and other cuentos de Puerto Rico? Pura puts her story in an envelope and mails it to Frederick Warren, a publisher. Soon, Perez y Martina is a book. Now a published author, puppeteer, and storyteller, Pura travels from branch to branch, classroom to classroom, to churches and community centers planting her story seeds in the mind, hearts and minds of children new to this island who wish to remember la lengua y los colores of home. Writing, learning, speaking, teaching, traveling, Pura does not slow down until, like the beautiful Martina, she meets her Perez. On a December day in New York, Pura marries the musician Clarence Cameron White. Un año away from the library, she decides, one year to start a new life as a wife. But a year stretches on. Together they travel to new cities. Clarence plays his music. Pura tells her stories. They are happy years of music and writing, separations and reunions, friends, families, and stories, always. Until on a June day in New York, Clarence stops playing his music and Pura's story must begin again. It is 1961. Pura returns to the library. There are others now, storytellers who make puppets dance who read Perez y Martina, The Tiger and the Rabbit, Juan Bobo, The Three Magi, and many more of Pura's stories to the children. The she seeds she has planted, the roots that grew shoots into the open air of possibility have become a lush landscape into which she steps as though she has never left.
I want to say that's the last page. Yep, and then there's an author's note about, you know, clearing up the biographer stuff. But yeah. Yay. Yay. <laughs> All right, I'll, hold on, I gotta fix myself. Huh. Thanks for sharing um, yeah. that beautiful story with us, Trina. Would you mind putting the um, title in the chat? Yes. For yes. folks' benefits, once your once your face is fixed. <laughs> fix my face. <laughs> and I'm very excited for either. I mean, we'll again. Mags, you can take next month if you would like to read something. Um, but, I'd be happy to. Um, <laughs> I, I mentioned that this is one of the like you know award winners that we've had. The new award winners for this year are announced in two days, and librarians always get very very excited to see who is going to win the new awards this year and be our our exciting books. Yeah, it's fun to take some time just to celebrate good books and good stories and come together and something then that we can all enjoy but yeah so thank you for sharing that beautiful story with us trina um kind of feel like we're starting to wrap up a little bit are y'all ready to talk about next month i i i think so i think we can talk about what we're <laughs> not reading next month um so I, <laughs> I know i know this is book club but i would like you all to think of it more as story club um in in a general sense and often those are in books um but as we all know there are many ways to tell stories and as many of us know through zeldathon and side quest those stories could be in video games you guys ready to do a video game for book club next month? Yeah, we are going to be playing slash watching uh, Undertale. Um, Which Max before. has not played. This will be a first playthrough for her. Yep. So I have never played Undertale before. I, I started it, but made it like an hour or two in several years ago. Um, so I will be coming to it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the concept, Hermione, who's expressing confusion, is that um, we are going to, as a community, play through Undertale. I'm going to be playing it here on the Zeldathon stream over the course of the few weeks leading up to our next book club meeting. Just February 20th. Um, so, <laughs> yep, that February 20th is our next and meeting. So beginning February 4th. First, I believe, Ilya. Am I, do I have this yeah, right? Yeah. Yep. February 1st, I'm going to be playing it on Monday evenings um, for the next three weeks after that on stream. Mm -hmm. So if you don't own the game and can't buy it, that's cool. You can just uh, tune in and join us as we'll be enjoying both the game and the story together. And then when we come together for our next book club meeting, we will be discussing all kinds of things about the story of Undertale. We'll talk about the story. We'll talk about the narrative. We'll talk about characters. We'll talk about music. Um, there's lots of different like multimedia elements that can really come together in a new, a new format that we'll be enjoying a story in together. Um, so we're really excited to shake, shake things up, try something new. Um, <laughs> we know a lot of people have some pretty strong feelings about Undertale, so we hope that y'all will come out and share those feelings with us um, when we come back together to discuss. Yeah. Phil thinks it's a good choice, so I feel totally validated <laughs> in this decision um, because Phil always has good takes. <laughs> So there thanks for that vote of confidence. Okay, we so. can, yes, we we, there, we we can discuss people's strong opinions, and we can discuss my apparent opinion of lack of opinion. <laughs> I don't. Know. We'll talk it out. <laughs> I'm not you know what? In, sure in a world, <laughs> in a world of hot takes, not having a hot take is sometimes the hottest hottest take. <laughs> <laughs> Come back in February to find out why Trina doesn't have strong feelings about Undertale. <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah so we hope that y'all will join us uh back here on the Zeldathon channel february 20th um Ilya, do you want to talk a little bit are you ready to talk about some other things that we have coming up on the channel um in the meantime oh boy um sorry not to put you on the spot <laughs> no, it's okay um so uh next week we will be having a another randomizer by a lovely super mc gamer he will be learning how to do the Majora's Mask randomizer this Tuesday at 6.30. Um, how many books let you go on dates with characters? Have, have you heard of Choose Your Own Adventures? I mean, I'm pretty sure Choose Your Own Adventure. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Also, literally, basically, like, all visual novels. I don't want to say all visual novels, but, like, no, most, most visual novels. <laughs> I think the yeah. only visual novel I've ever played, like, that was the whole plot. <laughs> Going on dates with different yeah. characters. We call those dating simulators. <laughs> okay, uh... Anyway. Sorry, I'm <laughs> I always get distracted by chat. It's like yeah, don't read chat, like... Ilya. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, after that, on... Oh, boy. Uh, Saturday, again. Next Saturday, uh, we will be having a community game sort uh game night where our lovely friend dynomation will also be playing among us but in minecraft because that's a thing and uh he has been very excited to play it so i hope everybody can uh come and join him and hang out talonos stop it how dare you uh <laughs> Ilya, stop reading chat <laughs> <laughs> sorry um Besides Don't talk about that... your butts in chat, y'all. <laughs> Max, <laughs> be <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, but that's it for the rest of January. Uh, I am still working on uh, the schedule for February with everybody else. Getting a lot of things figured out. Besides Mags, we will also be having um, some Dark Souls later in the month. I will give you guys more specifics on that later as soon as we figure things out. Meg's talking about her booty in the chat. Um, what? Let's see. <laughs> what other things have we figured out? Um, hoping to do some Splatoon on the 6th. Uh, but gotta confirm, make sure that's actually gonna happen. Besides that, uh, have some art, some more book club, and we'll see how we go. So, yeah, I think that's about it for me. Yeah. Cool. More and more good content as time goes on, so... <laughs> Thanks to everyone who's hanging out here on the Zeldathon channel with us. Yeah, thank you for coming to Book Club, and we will see y'all next time. Bye-bye! <laughs>